Ladies and gentlemen, team number nine. Hi, uh, my name is Noah. This is my colleague Yuko, Michaela, Greg, and Caroline. Now, due to the rules of Envirothon, we can't tell you which state, province, or territory, or maybe even China, where we're from, so you'll just have to guess from this point out. Uh, we are representing Enville Aquatic Conservation Group. So, Thon Watershed is a healthy, productive ecosystem in Ontario, Canada. It provides over a billion dollars in the form of ecosystem services, recreation, tourism, and uh, other uses to the surrounding area. Currently, a threat looms. The newly detected silver carp has the potential to stress and extirpate native flora and fauna, such as the resident lake trout, lake whitefish, smallmouth bass, phytoplankton, and more. The silver carp was likely introduced through either bait dumping or migration through connected rivers and lakes that were previously infected. Aquaculture and aquarium dumping are not likely vectors for introduction, as it is illegal to own any Asian carp under the Aquatic Invasive Species Regulations of 2015. As the health of this ecosystem is critical to both the local economy and environment, we have devised a comprehensive plan to prepare for and mitigate the effects of the Asian carp and other potential invaders as well. The plan will be run in accordance with several pertinent plans and laws, including the Ontario Invasive Species Strategy, the Federal Aquatic Invasive Species Program, and the recent Aquatic Invasive Species Regulations I mentioned a moment ago. Specifically, our plan will focus on several tenants, especially those of early detection rapid response, the invasive pest management cycle, community outre outreach, uh, economic sustainability, and collaboration. Under our Watershed Invasive Species Eradication and Rehabilitation Plan, or the Wiser Community Plan, Thon will prosper. As a brief, brief overview, Yuko will discuss the environmental factors in our plan and the considerations of funding. Greg will cover the management strategies of CARP and other invaders as well. Caroline will describe community involvement and legislation enforcement. Michaela will detail political issues, economic impacts, and agency partnerships. Finally, I'll wrap up the presentation. That was choreographed. Do not worry. This is all part of the plan. This is how the presentation is supposed to go. So, as one aspect of our wiser community plan, we will introduce an identifiable and uniting figure to champion our cause. For that reason, we will incorporate Teresa the Trout, a native lake trout. Uh, she will provide information to the community and further our cause. Now, Yuko will discuss the environmental factors of our plan. Thank you. The silver carp has the potential to devastate the aquatic system of Thon Watershed. Given the risk assessment of the silver carp, the chances of its establishment and proliferation throughout other smaller lakes and even the Great Lakes are high and reasonably certain. Once established, the silver carp would begin to consume phytoplankton and zooplankton, two viable sources of food for native juvenile fish including the yellow perch, lake trout, lake whitefish, smallmouth bass, and, wa and the walleye. Because silver carp can consume up to 20% of their body weight in food, a substantial amount of plankton will be reduced, leading to an abrupt and significant change in the aquatic food web. Additionally, pathogens such as the spring viremia can affect native fish such as the fathead minnow. Clearly, the aquatic wildlife will be affected, but what about the chemical makeup of the water itself? Well, Asian carp such as the silver carp cause algae blooms and decreases in the in the plankton uh, population, both of which can uh, change the ability of sunlight to warm the water body. This would upset the delicate balance of nutrients and temperatures needed by certain species of fish to live and breed. All of these changes in the water bodies of Thon Watershed will undoubtedly precipitate onto other components of the environment, such as terrestrial wildlife. Species higher on the trophic level, including ospreys and eagles, cannot eat the silver carp, thus leaving the carp without any natural predators. And native fish species uh, serve a vital role in the food, food web for predatorial species that could not survive otherwise. This process of nutrient cycling indirect, indirectly affects both soils and subsequently the forest ecosystems as well. The bird species mentioned earlier provide nutrients through their fecal matter and use trees as habitat. So as you can tell, even just one fish species can damage several ecosystems through its effect on the nutrient cycle. This is why we, the Enville Aquatic Conservation Group, advise an early detection and rapid response method of more than just the silver carp. 
Known invasives such as the emerald ash borer, the purple loose strife, the round goby, and other potentially destructive species should be monitored for simultaneously using scientific me methods similar to what Greg will explain later in his management plan and community outreach um, projects that Caroline will go into later. And now, Michaela will discuss the economical impacts of the silver carp. There are numerous economic implications for the encroaching silver carp species on the Thon watershed. The planktivorous diet of the carp would have the effect of reducing the populations of bait fish, prey fish, and sport fish, all of which would impact commercial and recreational fishing in the area. The fish's establishment would also result in reduced recreational rentals for activities like boating, water skiing, canoeing, and paddle boarding due to its dangerous leaping nature and threat to human safety. Additionally, recreational activities along with property values along the highly desirable shoreline would decrease because of the mats of algae known as cladophora, which have been known to spread in bodies of water with a silver carp presence. These algal mats can harbor toxin-producing bacteria that negatively affect water quality and that make it unpleasant for swimming and beach-going. The reduced water quality would also require the community to expend resources in an effort to clean the water and re-establish the watershed as a suitable source of drinking water, as access to clean water is an important social justice issue. The annual $200 million generated from tourism and recreation, not to mention the money brought in from commercial fishing, industry, and real estate highlights the great economic importance of the eradication of the silver carp. And now Greg will discuss management strategies. As Yuko and Michaela mentioned earlier, the perpetuation of the silver carp has the potential to irreparably damage the ecology, economy, and communities of the Thon watershed. To mitigate these impacts, we at the Envil Aquatic Conservation Group will lay the foundation of our management strategy on the invasive pest management cycle of early detection and rapid response, as modified by the Department of Fisheries and Oceans in the Asian Carp Program. These steps include prevention, early warning, response, and management. As the carp have already infiltrated the Thon watershed, we begin with the early warning phase. Although we have already been notified of, this, of several sightings of the silver carp in the watershed, in Rainy Lake and along the river, we are unaware of the total number of individual carp in the watershed. To effectively determine this, we will construct 10 monitoring stations along the length of the river and in the lakes. One station will be located at each of the sighting locations, three at river bridges, including Arch Bridge, one at the mouth of the river, and immediately upstream and downstream the dam and lift locks. The conservation group will develop a monitoring protocol outlining eDNA testing, electrofishing, turbidity measurements, and various citizen science efforts. eDNA tests will immediately be conducted to determine whether or not carp are present along certain reaches of the river. While the test may cost thousands of dollars, the methods will be a rapid way of determining whether or not treatment is necessary at a certain reach of the river, and will be aiding in the protection of a billion dollar ecosystem services provided in the watershed. Electrofishing will be conducted to collect baseline data regarding species present at each site. Measurements of turbidity, or water clarity, will be taken to measure the effects of carp feeding on phytoplankton. Additional volunteering, volunteer monitoring by citizen scientists will engage anglers, First Nation peoples, and other local community members through the use of such tools as the Invasive Species Hotline and EDD maps, which will bolster more professional observations collected Collected data will be input into mathematical models and GIS software to, determine, to create maps of regions most affected by carp, as with the Trent Severn Water Soldier Project in 2008. High priority designation will be given to spawning grounds and subsistence fishing areas utilized by First Nation peoples, where carp impacts will be most detrimental. Under the coordination of an action incident command system of the Envil Aquatic Con Conservation Group, Biologists, local anglers, and other volunteers will undertake in a rapid response to the carp infestation, utilizing tranmill, trap, and fike nets to remove fish in an effort modeled after the Department of Fisheries and Ocean Canada's successful response to the grass carp in July 2015. Trained biologists will also utilize electrofishing, a process that does not harm fish, only um, stunning them. Likewise, traps and nets will not harm native fish, as they will simply be caught and released. 
if carp does, not be does become established, it will be necessary to control its spread. Electric barriers may be utilized, as with the Chicago area water system, but would ra be rather costly to operate. A weir system could be more, a more economical option, as it would not require the use of electricity, and is a system that prov has provided useful for managing rainbow trout in Fallen Leaf Lake in Lake Tahoe, California. The system can also collect other fish species, aiding in the continued monitoring process. To prevent future infestations or introductions of Asian carp or other invasive species, the Wiser Community Plan will include outreach programs to educate the community on the spread of invasive species. The program will increase public signage and public service announcements on TV and on social media, which will be used to strongly discourage the release of bait buckets into aquatic habitats and the accidental transport of aquatic invasive species on watercraft, watercraft through the Clean Drain Dry program. Public education efforts will also be expanded to terrestrial invasive species, stressing to citizens how pests such as the emerald ash borer and Asian longhorn beetle have the potential to de devastate the province's forests. Caroline will now discuss community involvement. Teresa the Trout knows that, as in any invasive species removal plan, the public is a vital resource in ensuring the eradication of silver carp from the Thon watershed. For this reason, it is extremely important to keep both residents and visitors informed and involved in the management effort. Firstly, we will reach out, we will reach out to the local First Nations groups in order to access helpful traditional ecological knowledge and work with them to ensure that carp do not affect subsistence fishing or culturally significant ecosystems. Additionally, the knowledge of indigenous groups provides an excellent source of education for the general public. Holding water awareness walks, similar to those held by the Anishinaabe Nation, will be a perfect way to inform visitors and residents while also involving First Nations individuals. Another important community group to address is the 50,000 annual visitors to the Thon watershed who enjoy the many different recreational activities the area has to offer. These people will be greeted to the area with obvious signs warning them of the threats Asian carp pose to their beloved vacation spot, including the public health risk of cladophora of algae blooms and the threats to recreational and commercial fishing. In addition, they will be invited to attend interactive informational community meetings along with permanent residents or access information on our website or various social media platforms. Both groups will also be subject to random checks for live carp at docking sites to prevent the movement of carp in alignment with the aquatic invasive species regulations implemented in 2015 by the federal government of Canada. These checks will be noted on signs at docking sites along with information explaining their necessity. In an extension of this program, those who, those who report and turn in caught silver carp will receive collectible badges to show their pride for protecting their ecosystem and to incentivize removal. Another exciting way to involve the local community is the annual Carpnival we plan to host in the area. Similar to Algonquin Provincial Park's strategy for controlling invasive smallmouth bass, the Carpnival will encourage locals to catch as many carp as possible to cook and serve for the community. This event will help spread information, draw in individuals, and control the carp population all in a fun and engaging way. The Carpnival will also provide a way to showcase removal efforts and celebrate local culture. <coughs> Children will particularly benefit from, its, from this event as its fun, family-oriented nature will get them excited to learn and come back each year. This is especially beneficial because it ensures the long-term stewardship of the ecosystem. Lastly, residents interested in citizen science will be encouraged to report sightings of silver carp or other new invasive species to the Invasive Species Hotline and EDD Maps Ontario. This is critical because it will help us at the Enville Aquatic Conservation Group more easily track the spread of silver carp, the effectiveness of our, of our management efforts, and monitor for the introduction of new invasives. And now, Michaela with agency collaboration. Collaboration between various participating agencies is a vital component to successful invasive species management. Through cooperation, agencies can coordinate their efforts and workload to be the most efficient in field operations. Further, they can share data and research to avoid redundancy and wasted time. This collaboration can be done via systems such as Skype, cloud information services, and professional networks and conferences. This way, the management plan will be effectively implemented and maintained. Some of these agencies that we would look to for a partnership include Ontario's Invasive Species Awareness Program, 
the Invasive Species Centre, and the Ontario Federation of Anglers and Hunters. And now Yuko will discuss funding and costs. As with any plan or project, an economically feasible budget as well as funding sources are necessary for execution. Both the man management plan outlined by Greg and the efforts to reach out to the community as explained by Caroline will cost money, although these figures will vary depending on the effectiveness of the plan and the community's willingness to participate. For a management plan, the most substantial costs will come from the creation of a weir, use of nets and electrofishing, and hiring permitted biologists. This will cost around $300,000 per year, depending on the number of biologists needed per year and the number of weirs set up in the area. While this may sound like a steep price tag, we took into account the value of the Thon watershed and the risk of doing nothing, as Noah will describe later. But the costs aren't really what you guys want to hear. Where is all this money going to come from? While most of our funding will come from the Ministry of Resources and Nature, a federal agency, we have a couple of, a couple of ideas for a supplemental income as well as ways to prevent some costs. The Ontario Trillium Foundation is the most generous, generous foundation in Ontario towards environmental projects. If we apply for their collective impact, impact grant, we can receive at least $250,000. The Government of Ontario also gives out $20,000 grants for restoration projects. From a more local viewpoint, partnering with local businesses and organizations can serve as a minor yet community-involving funding source. Lastly, the use of the community workforce and enthusiastic youth can help mitigate the cost of manual monitoring. With these methods of funding, we are confident that the Wiser Community Plan embodies a perfect balance between efficient and effective. And now know with the cost of doing nothing. To understand the situation at hand, we must contextualize these efforts and what we're doing and what it would entail, especially what doing nothing would entail. To illustrate this, consider the zebra mussel and ballast water. In 1980, Joe Shorman of Environment Canada carried out an analysis of 55 cargo liners and their ballast water, finding 56 non-native species. Shorman suggested that these species could become established and presented his findings to Environment Canada, the US Coast Guard, and the Canadian Coast Guard. Every agency promptly shelved the research. Within a decade, the zebra mussel, along with a range of other non-natives, such as the Eurasian ruff, became established in the Great Lakes. Within another two decades of inaction, the zebra mussel had caused billions of dollars in damage in the form of lost ecological service, reduced recreation capabilities, damaged fisheries, ruined infrastructure, and much more. In fact, according to a presentation given by a representative of the Invasive Species Center Ontario, the ec economic cost to Ontario still is 75 to $91 million a year. It is especially absurd that after comprehensive ballast regulations were finally passed in 2006, not a single new invasive species had spread to the Great Lakes through ballast water. Why weren't those regulations passed in 1980? This is why we must act right now, as opposed to pushing this problem off to a later date. If we do not, the costs in all th uh, forms to thaw and watershed will increase exponentially. We will face the same repercussions incurred by zebra mussel inaction, this is why the people of Thon Watershed must accept the wiser communi community plan and espouse the tenets of the invasive species management cycle, community collaboration, uh, early detection rapid response, economic sustainability, and organizational partnership. Remember, Teresa the Trout says you have to live wiser. Thank you. We will now take questions. able to only get half of the funding you wanted to have, what would your priorities be? If we were to get half of the funding, uh, is this good? Just gladly. If we were to get half of the funding uh, uh, that we would have gotten uh, at the beginning of the project, we would not prioritize weirs because weirs would cost um, a great amount of money, even though it would be more economical than using electric barriers, we would instead prioritize um, 
involved in the community by um, getting local anglers and fisher fishermen to uh, catch carp using catch carp using um, using nets um, and also uh, traps and other easy mechanical methods. How would you measure the both short-term and long-term success of your plan? The way that we'd measure success is uh, probably not through total eradication of the carp, because even though it would be the ideal situation, it's not necessarily feasible. In the short term, we'd measure it through community involvement and outsourcing some of our costs to citizen science and the like. And in the long term, we'd like to maintain the ecological services that this watershed already provides. So if we were to, able to uh, keep it at around the same level, if we were to uh, make sure that the trout were, or excuse me, not the trout, the carp, were uh, unable to spread or take a stranglehold on the local fish, then we would consider it a success. How would you go about building a sense of community support for this issue? So all of our community involvement efforts are designed to kind of unify the community. That's why we have Teresa the Trout as sort of a symbol that they can all rally behind, as well as the Carpnival, which is designed to bring all the community into one place to see what's going on, to learn, and to not only learn about invasive species and learn about the carp, but also to learn about their local culture and meet new people and experience and join together in this movement, as well as the informational meetings, which would also allow community members to all be in one room together sharing ideas and their thoughts on how things could be better done or maybe just congratulating us, hopefully. <laughs> And it's important to remember that as this community will be affected by the silver carp if it is allowed to stay, if we do not get rid of it or mitigate uh, the effects of it, they'll all suffer as well as the ecosystem. So if we present that information in an, a clear way, then we think that people will come forward, like the uh, Aboriginal people or the local anglers or whoever is involved in the community. Okay. How would you sustain the momentum of your plan over the longer term? Okay, well, I think definitely what Caroline talked about earlier with the community involvement is something that can continue on for, uh, for a number of years. And, you know, we don't just want to focus on the carp, although that is the issue at hand. We want to use this issue as a jump start to get people to really know what invasive species are and how we can manage them and, you know, uh, get support behind uh, trying to eradicate or reduce those numbers. Okay, so how would you... Uh how would this plan be adaptable to other invasive species? So, as I explained earlier, there, you know, there are a number of invasive species that are uh, you know, in, the, in the area, and although the carp is special in that it's an aquatic species, and you know, there are other invasive species that are more terrestrial maybe, um, there are still fish invasive species that can be directly monitored using the same, uh, the weirs and things that we talked about in our plan. Uh, but the point is so that the community knows about these sorts of methods and that if we do try hard enough, we can stop it, even though uh, they may be different terrestrial slash uh, flying species. <laughs> also, now that we know that there are invasive species in the area, it's easier to spread information about more invasive species. So with our signage about Asian carp, we hope to also in, um, increase information about you know, not transporting firewood, limiting basically all the ways that people can unknowingly introduce invasives into their area. We hope to spread more information about that in conjunction with everything else that we're talking about, specifically about the CARP. That was an, an excellent report that you put together in just one day. If you had more time, what area of the report would you focus on? I think that one really important thing that we would focus on would, would be the costs and the funding. Since we didn't necessarily have the resources to go into what exactly, exactly uh, maybe electrofishing costs or what exactly eDNA costs, that would be important. And especially considering that we're working for the government and getting a government grant, it's not like we'll be able to spend the money willy-nilly. We'll have to, you know, uh, submit to audits and stuff like that and just prove that we're spending our money efficiently and that we've put the research into what's effective uh, in terms of cost. How would you market the benefits of your program? Um, I'd say that most of the benefits would be marketed through the community forums and the signage.
by bringing the community together, we can, we can share the knowledge that we've acquired through this plan and sh share to, with them why they're doing what they're doing and why it's great, and they can see the benefits themselves in the restoration of their aquatic ecosystem as well as their shorelines, which are very important for real estate purposes. There are, as I think, 50,000 cottagers that yes. come, so they will see the results, and then if they don't, it'll be delivered through the forums or the Carpenival. Hopefully there will be no more carp at the Carpenival eventually, and they'll see those effects. And I think a big part of our project is that we're trying to weigh the risks against how much it'll cost. So we're not, um, we're, tr we're trying to see exactly how the Asian carp would be uh, damaging to the area and we're not trying to prioritize the most uh, expensive, the most high tech methods. We want to really focus on what people can do grassroots as well as uh, the bigger projects like weirs and whatnot. Ladies and gentlemen, team number nine. <laughs> Good job, team. <laughs> Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh. He left. No, left. Uh, okay, <laughs> let's go down here.